welcome to all of you. Welcome to the Rotary Club of Atlanta. It's great to see all of you on this very special day. And thank you also uh, to all of our guests and visitors. We welcome you. In the South, we have a wonderful tradition. Whenever there is a visiting preacher, we ask him or her to lead us in prayer. I can think of no one more fitting than our special speaker today to lead us in our invocation. And so Reverend Raphael Warnock has kindly agreed to lead us in our invocation and our Pledge of Allegiance. And after that, he and Reverend Con Wisher will be sharing a special real-time announcement for all of us. Please join me in welcoming Senator Raphael Warnock. Would you bow your heads to your hearts? God, you are known by many names, worshiped in many houses. You are the God of all creation. And in you we live, move, and have our being. Of one blood, you have made all nations to dwell upon the earth that we might seek after God. And yet you are not far from any one of us. So help us to be instruments of your peace and of your justice in the earth. And in all things, may you be glorified and your name be praised. Humbly, reverently, we offer this prayer in the name of the God who loves us into freedom and frees us into loving. Amen. Amen. To the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. For over 15 years, Peachtree Presbyterian Church has been connected to fledgling Christian communities in nations where they do not enjoy the freedoms that we enjoy in this country. And it came to our attention, one of the communities that we've been connected to for the last four years in Kabul, Afghanistan, that four weeks ago they had just received their government ID cards that were now identifying themselves no longer as Muslim but as Christian in that country because they trusted that that government of Afghanistan would now give them that equal treatment under the law. So you can imagine their concern when Kabul fell and when the Taliban took over the city, you can imagine that they knew that they were on a list and that their lives were in jeopardy. When we received news of praying for them, we had heard that they were standing at the gates of the airport, like hundreds and thousands of other people, hoping for a miracle and praying that they would be able to get out. When I received word of where they were, Starting four years ago in the Atlanta Friendship Initiative, a program that is very near and dear to the heart of this Rotary Club, Raphael Warnock and I were paired together. And because I had his cell phone number, I called him and I asked him if there was any way that I could get in touch and he could put his staff in touch with our staff team and that we could make a connection in the State Department. When we made that connection in the State Department, which he graciously did, the representatives of the State Department said, don't get your hopes up. We're working feverishly just to get our own Americans out and for the individuals who helped us. And we understand that they are in danger and that their lives are in jeopardy. But we just don't think that there's much that we can do. They left the airport two hours before the bomb went off. And so their lives were spared. They went back home and were about to try to flee through the border of Pakistan. But within 36 hours of the conversation that the senator and I had, the U.S. military came and picked them up in the middle of the night 
and I am pleased to announce that they are in Qatar right now, fully in safety. There are 18 souls that have been rescued because of the commitment to friendship. There are 18 lives that are on their way to America, and Senator, they will lack for nothing because they have an army of 7,000 people at the Peachtree Presbyterian Church that will make sure that they have every need that they could ever have. And we need to prepare all of our hearts for the hundreds of thousands of people who will come to our country to experience the freedom and the joy of what it means to be a part of this great nation. And so, Senator, I just personally wanted to say thank you to you for your responsiveness, for your team, and that there really, truly are 18 lives that have been spared because of the partnership that we have. Can we thank Senator Warnock for this? Well, I want to thank my friend and brother, Rich Canwisher, for his kind words and thoughts. Um, we use whatever influence we have to be as helpful as we can be. But the credit belongs to the military men and women who lay it all on the line every single day. And if anything, this moment ought to remind us uh, not to take what they do for granted, never to see it as routine. And so I'm thinking today about the men and women who serve in uniform. I was in Valdosta this weekend spending time um, at Moody Air Force Base. And some of our soldiers, I had a chance to pray with them as they had boarded a C-130 they were headed to Holloman Air Force Base in Texas to receive Afghan citizens like those you described. And I was just honored to be able to be there to pray with them as they continued their mission. And so we think about them and we think about their sacrifice. Jesus said, no greater love hath anyone than this, than one who would lay down his life for his friends as you think about that text, think about the 13 soldiers that we lost. Thank you and, and God bless each and every one of you. Welcome again to all of you. Uh, what an amazing and miraculous story shared by Reverend Warnock and Reverend Con Wisher. And with that story, I also wanted to celebrate a, a rotary moment. Um, you heard Reverend Conwisher mention the Friendship Initiative. Um, this is something that's near and dear to our hearts as a club. And as you may remember, this initiative was started several years back by the late Bill Nordmark and his partner, original partner pairing, John Grant. And that, that set of friendships has now grown to over 150 friendship pairings. I wanted to say a special uh, word of acknowledgement to Bill Nordmark Jr., whom I believe is, is here somewhere, if he could stand. Um, I know that we are all celebrating the fruits of the amazing initiative that he and his friendship partner, his father and his friendship partner, John Grant, started several years ago. So we will, we will celebrate them and thank you again. We have such an exciting program today. Um, we, are, we are hosting Senator Warnock, as you know, to share his remarks and thoughts with us. And we're also excited to welcome to the podium Morehouse President David Thomas, who will introduce the Senator. And um, really excited about having a chance to engage with both of them. And we'll have a chance at the end of the program for your questions and conversation with the Senator. 
I'd like to start by introducing a special guest who has multiple ties to several of our Rotarians and speakers. Zach Bryant is the guest of Rotary, Rotary uh, member De Tracy Techow, who is the head of the Atlanta Boy Scout Council here. Zach is a freshman at Morehouse College. He is an Eagle Scout from Troop 213, which is chartered to Ebenezer Baptist Church. And especially and most important, Zach is a true local hero. Several years ago, Zach, as an Eagle Scout, was recognized for saving the life of a younger Boy Scout on the Nantahala River when the younger Scout fell into the swirling rapids and Zach pulled him out and saved his life literally single-handedly with one arm. Welcome, Zach. I want to thank you for your bravery and also for your service as an Eagle Scout. We have a number of additional guests. Uh, if, if you could each stand when I call your name and then I would ask our Rotary group to hold applause till the end so we can say welcome to all of them together. Um, Theron Johnson, guest of Rodney Bullard. Also Lori Smith and Julie Bryant Fisher, both guests of Rodney Bullard. Welcome Thomas Davenport, guest of Glenn Weiss. The Reverend Winnie Van Gazy, hope I'm saying that right, guest of Bruce Gunter. And also Adelaide Steedley, guest of Bruce Gunter. Drew Shipper, guest of Billy Levine. Johannes Nijman, again, apologies for the pronunciation, guest of Sam Williams. Asif Mujtaba, guest of Charlie Crawford. We have four guests of Reverend Richard Canwisher. They are all Zacharias Fellows program members, and they are Uezo Fluellen, Alexis Schneider, Mariah Smith, and Elizabeth Payne. Several guests of Senator Warnock, including Adam Magnus, Michael Brewer, and Lawrence Bell, and Renee Glover, guest of Sharon Gay. Welcome to all of you. Oh. Oh. And I'm sorry, Amy Nelson, also one of my guests, so welcome, Amy. <laughs> A couple of announcements to run through with you all. Um, you may remember a few weeks back, we congratulated Rotarian Ernest Greer for being honored as the CEO of the year by the Atlanta Business League. Well, now Ernest also will be honored on September 18th by the Boys and Girls Club of Metro Atlanta, or excuse me, Big Brothers and Big Sisters of Metro Atlanta, who will honor Ernest and Patrice Greer with their esteemed Legacy Award. Honduras Hope is hosting their annual fundraising event on September 23rd. Many of our Rotarians, as you know, participate in this amazing annual service trip to the Agalta Valley in Honduras, which is a program helping to sustain their local schools. We recently learned that this annual trip is the largest ongoing project in the world, on, on, largest ongoing service project in the world for Rotary International. Our congratulations to Bob Hope, the man who, mares, who wears many hats, uh, for his steadfast leadership in this initiative. And if you have any questions about the fundraising event or about the trip coming up in March, please see Bob. Thank you, Bob. <laughs> and last, in our ongoing effort to protect the health and safety of each of you, as our members, um, we are going to refrain from our singing of patriotic hymns in the meantime, following the CDC guidance against singing in large groups. Appreciate your 
patience with that. And as always, very much appreciate your diligence in wearing your masks to help us take care of one another's health. Our next speaker is a wonderful friend to our club whom we all know for the many important roles he has served. David Thomas is a fellow Rotarian, a former Harvard professor, a former Georgetown dean, a doctor of organizational behavior, and of course, the president of Morehouse College. However, in the lesser known facts category, I have also learned that President Thomas has owned yet another new skill during these past few, moment, uh, past few months of COVID. Apparently he's quite the chef. He's recently rediscovered a series of dishes from his childhood in Kansas City, things like smothered pork chops and barbecue ribs, and as I understand it, his signature dish that he is most known for is his famous pot of beans and ham hocks. So, in addition to all of those roles and impressive titles that we know him for, I wanna make sure that we add acclaimed chef to his very stellar resume. So please join me in welcoming President Thomas who will introduce our future program. Thank you, Catherine. And Rich, now you know why I resisted the cookies, because I'm trying to recover from my COVID diet. Um, it is uh, an honor and a privilege uh, to stand here today, the first time that I've had the opportunity since I was inducted into Rotary to stand before you. Uh, and in this moment, to introduce one of Morehouse's favorite sons. Um, <clears throat> who probably needs no introduction, but I could not pass on the moment. Um, some know him as pastor and reverend. Some know him as doctor. All of us today know him as senator. Um, I want to apologize to any of his staff who worked on the introduction that I was given and to Bill. It was eloquently put, um, <clears throat> but um, I'm going to go off script. Um, I, as Catherine mentioned, uh, I was a professor of business for uh, <clears throat> over 22 years, and I studied leadership. And a habit of mine was to observe intently leaders. And in particular, um, I observed the fact that, you know, every leader, and all of you in this room who could qualify to be here, has a resume that reads great. The question is, how do we know who the man or woman is underneath that resume or that bio. And <clears throat> I often pay lots of attention to the story, to the individual story, and try to ask them what is their story. And I remember when I first got to Morehouse four years ago, I was told that I needed to meet this Reverend Raphael Warnock of Ebenezer Baptist Church uh, as all of you know, um, <clears throat> it is the ch church where another one of our illustrious alums pastored, Martin Luther King Jr., and his father, Martin Luther King Sr. And um, as I, in my early meeting with um, Raphael, I was struck by the way he told his story. Um, you know, I asked him, so essentially I say it more eloquently than this, what's your story? And there's some theme, two themes that struck me about the way he told his story, because you could tell it all kinds of ways. You know, came to Morehouse, I was president of the, of the chapel, I was X, Y, or Z, went and got my PhD. But <clears throat> in his story, the first thing that came through is that um, he is a son of Georgia. He is the product of two loving parents who worked hard raised a family of 12 children uh, in Caton Homes, public housing in Savannah, Georgia. And much of his family still resides there. Um, 
he told that story when he was on the campaign trail, but I can tell you that that's the way he started his story long before he was running for office. Another part of his story is that he acknowledges uh, what I call uh, being a community project. That he was not born a Morehouse man, nor was he born a reverend, a doctor, or a senator. But it is, those are roles that were forged out of his relationships with others and experiences that they created for him that prepare him for this moment. And then you talk to people who know him and what's the story they tell about him. As pastor for 15 years of Ebenezer, his congregants say he listens. He asks a lot of questions and he facilitates discovering what the best answer is in the moment based on what we know. He's committed to interfaith dialogue and inclusion, and one of his mentors, the, the dean of our chapel, refers to him as the quintessential moral cosmopolitan, which means that he engages the world without losing his moral compass. So to head back to the script, on January 5th, 2021, he was elected senator from Georgia. He has established himself as a key voice and influencer on the critical issues and challenges facing and opportunities facing our nation at this time. Whether we're talking about COVID relief, voting rights, the US Competition and Innovation Act, or how we make higher education affordable for all who want to seek it. He serves on the Senate Banking Committee, the Commerce Committee, the Agricultural Committee. I know firsthand because I've had to call his office at points in time since he became Senator that he's a champion for Atlanta and for the interests of all Georgians in Washington, D.C. The mission of Morehouse College is to educate men with disciplined minds who will lead lives of leadership and service. I am proud to say <clears throat> that Senator Raphael Warnock is an exemplar of the manifestation of that mission. And so with that, I give you Senator Raphael Warnock. Thank you so very much, President Thomas. It's wonderful to be here with you, and uh, thank you for your very kind and gracious and magnanimous introduction. I can think of perhaps only one other time I received a more generous introduction. The person who was supposed to introduce me didn't show up, <laughs> so I had to introduce myself. <laughs> Thank you so very much, I appreciate it. It's wonderful to be here um, at the Atlanta Rotary Club. Uh, ironically, uh, Reverend Ken Wisher and I d discussed my becoming a member of the club a few years ago, and um, you know, a lot of things happened. <laughs> and I got really, really busy. Of course, I'm in front of folks who are always busy. And, um, but one of the things that I did consider that slowed me down, didn't stop me from doing it, just gave me pause, was I, and I said this to him and he understands, pastors are very busy, Reverend. And I said, the one day I get off is Monday. <laughs> and y'all meet on Monday. And um, I guess the joke's on me because nowadays on Mondays I fly to Washington, D.C. It's wonderful to be here. I've been traveling all around the state all month on my jobs for Georgia tour. I love getting around Georgia, place where I was born and raised and educated at Morehouse College. But it's always great to be back in Atlanta. We mentioned the situation in Afghanistan earlier, but 
our hearts and minds are appropriately there. And we remember the American and Afghan lives lost in the terrible attacks in Kabul. I think about the work of our soldiers who risked their lives in order to save the lives of others. And I trust that their work will be remembered by history, their sacrifice etched in eternity. We think also about our sisters and brothers in Louisiana, some 16 years after Katrina. These are difficult times in many ways for many of us as we push our way through this pandemic. The decisions that leaders make are incredibly consequential at this time. The Supreme Court recently made it easier for families, many likely still waiting for rental assistance to get evicted from their homes in the middle of a pandemic. Congress must act when we return from recess to make sure that in the middle of a pandemic, families have the support that they need. The Delta variant is on the rise across the state and more and more of our children are landing in the hospital because of this awful virus. A virus which, by the way, I think teaches us important lessons. Lessons that we should have learned a long time ago. But when we're wrestling and dealing with an airborne deadly virus, if my neighbor is sick, that has implications not only for her, but for me. Because the virus is airborne. That doesn't make my, my neighbor my enemy. It underscores the ways in which my neighbor's future is inextricably connected to my own. Dr. King put it this way, we are tied in a single garment of destiny, caught up in an inescapable network of mutuality. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. The sense of the ways in which we're all connected that we are in this together. That is what has guided my work my entire life as a pastor. And then it is what has, has led me to do such a crazy thing with my life as run for the United States Senate. But I'm grateful for the journey. As we say in the black church, I wouldn't take nothing for my journey. I'm deeply honored to do this work. And I'm grateful for the ways in which Georgians showed up a few months ago in record numbers to change the shape of our federal government. Georgia, the home of Martin Luther King Jr., the greatest American, elected its state's first black United States senator and its first Jewish senator. <laughs> Regardless of your politics, that in and of itself is a hopeful moment that recalls the tradition of Martin Luther King Jr. and Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel marching in Selma together, pushing us closer towards our ideals. Rabbi Heschel said, when I marched alongside Dr. King, I felt like my legs were praying. And I submit that in this moment in which we push our way through this pandemic, as we wrestle with all of these issues, we need praying lips and we need praying legs. 
And so this is the work that we're focused on. I got elected to the Senate on January 5th. We saw a violent insurrectionist attack on the capital of the United States on January 6th. January 5th, Georgia elects a black senator, well on its way to electing a Jewish senator. January 6th, a violent insurrectionist attack on the Capitol. I remember January 6th because on that morning, I was having a good time after a long, grueling campaign. I was on Morning Joe, I was on Good Morning America. I knew I had arrived because I was on The View <laughs> talking to Whoopi Goldberg. But by lunchtime, there were vibrations on my phone and yours and rumblings that suggested that something was happening in the Capitol. And we know the rest of that story, that sad story. All within a 24-hour period, Georgia elects somebody who grew up in public housing to the Senate, violent insurrectionists on the Capitol. I submit that in those 24 hours, we witnessed the paradox of our grand and complicated American story. Like all families, our story is complicated. There's a way in which we are January 5th and January 6th, and every generation of Americans has to decide which one of those things we're going to be. And so Georgia extended to me this sacred trust. We went to the Senate. We passed the American Rescue Plan, put millions of shots in arms, thousands of dollars in the pockets of working families through direct relief checks. We put extra money in working families' bank accounts through the expanded child tax credit. We made available hundreds of millions of dollars for Georgia to expand Medicaid, which our state leaders still have not done. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. But Georgians made all of that possible by showing up. And Dr. Thomas, I submit that that's half of leadership. Half of leadership is just showing up. And we laid the groundwork for Georgia to make huge gains through the bipartisan infrastructure deal the Senate passed before we left earlier this month. And so we passed this bipartisan infrastructure bill, and I just want to take a moment to talk about what's in the bill. This infrastructure package that we just passed is going to make a real difference in our country. It is transformational. It will repair our roads and our bridges, strengthen public transportation, replace aging pipes to boost access to clean water. And more than that, it will improve connectivity and mobility across Georgia and address the consequences of worsening climate change. But I submit to you that a, an infrastructure bill is about more than bridges and roads and highways and public transportation, as important as all of that is. In my other day job, sometimes when families come to me, they've been struggling for a long time. Sometimes the argument's been going on so long, folks are mad, they don't even remember why they're mad. And sometimes I say to them, I, I don't have any easy answers for your problem. All families, by the way, are dysfunctional. Yeah, yours too. All families have some level of dysfunction. So, well, maybe I can't solve your problem, but maybe rather than working on each other, maybe you ought to find something to work on. Here's what you need to do. Go to the Home Depot, good Georgia company. Get some mulch. Get some flowers. Work on the landscape of your house or upgrade the bathrooms or the kitchen. In other words, get focused on working on something together, big or small, paint the fence. And as you engage one another, maybe you can talk through some of those other issues. I submit to you that in this moment in which we are teetering between January 5th and January 6th, 
the worst of who we are, and the highest of our ideals, that the American family needs a home improvement project that will work not only on bridges and roads, but more importantly, on the spirit of the country. That it will, ins will inspire us to dream big again and to do big things together because after all, we are the United States of America. That's what we do, we do big things. And so I'm excited about this infrastructure bill, which I think will help the spirit of the country. It's also a jobs bill. And directly and indirectly over time, this package will support and create jobs in Atlanta. Georgia will get $135 million from this package to, to help build more electric vehicle charging stations. Georgia will also get at least $100 million to deploy broadband in some of Georgia's most high-need areas. That includes rural communities where reliable internet access is inconsistent at best, contributing to the divide, the digital divide, which has implications for the homework divide, for telemedicine. I spent a lot of time in rural Georgia. Farmers will tell you that you can't even farm efficiently today without a broadband connection. Broadband in the 21st century is what electricity was in the 20th century. And so people need access and broadband must also be affordable. One last example, I led efforts in the bipartisan infrastructure bill to invest $5 billion in alternative buses like low and, emissions, low and no emission buses, including, including a dedicated $2.5 billion specifically for electric buses. This was based on the Clean Commute for Kids Act I introduced to make significant federal investments to electrify our yellow school buses. These investments will help reduce the emissions that contribute to climate change and improve public health. But on top of that, they support the innovative work at Georgia companies like the Bluebird Corporation in Fort Valley, Georgia. Like many of you, I grew up riding those Bluebird yellow school buses. But what you may not know is that they are leading the way right now in greening our nation's yellow school buses. I visited their facility in May to learn more about their innovative work. And with demand for electric buses and school buses growing, they will need the workforce to keep up. That's more jobs for Georgians. But here in Atlanta specifically, more than $900 million in transit investments will go to job creators like MARTA and not only help them improve and strengthen their service but grow their workforce. In May, I talked to MARTA CEO Jeff Parker, who's here today about how this deal would help their agency. He told me then how these investments will help MARTA transition to more modern electric buses and that this will create jobs and support Georgia manufacturers up and down the supply chain. There's also $1 billion that I fought to get in the bill that's dedicated to funding large scale infrastructure projects that will reconnect communities. I had job generating economy boosting projects in Atlanta like the Midtown Connector and Project Stitch in mind when we secured that provision in the package. And I'm going to keep fighting to make sure federal dollars flow to these local priorities. I'm happy to report that there's federal funding I fought for in the bill that could be used to support the completion of parts of the Atlanta Beltline. And separately, I'm also fighting for an additional $5 million in the appropriations process to help complete the Southside Trail. We'd be here all day if I kept listing all of the investments coming to Georgia in this bill. I'm proud we were able to get this bipartisan legislation passed in the Senate. It's so bipartisan that it includes something called the Cruz-Warnock Amendment. Yeah, that Cruz, Ted Cruz. 
folks saw that and they said, how did Ted Cruz and Raphael Warnock, the two Raphaels in the Senate, come together on an amendment? It's very simple. It's called I-14. It's a highway he needs it built out in Texas. Same highway he needs in Texas, we need in Georgia to connect places like Columbus and Augusta where some of our military installations are located. And I'll work with whomever I've got to work with to get something done for Georgia. And so when the rest of the Senate heard that Ted Cruz and Raphael Warnock were doing an amendment together, he stood up on the floor of the Senate, offered up the amendment. I heard myself say things I never imagined. I agree with him. <laughs> and so our colleagues said, let's pass it on a voice vote. No need to debate this issue. They passed the bill, they passed the amendment. But I think that's a metaphor for the work that we need to do. That there is a road that runs through our humanity that does not know the boundaries of geography or politics or race or class. And that more and more we've got to find ways that lead to the path that connects our humanity in the middle of a pandemic that tragically reminds us that we're inextricably connected to one another. It doesn't stop there. Before the Senate left Washington earlier this month, we started the process to pass a robust economic package that's going to provide even more support to hardworking Georgia families and strengthen the infrastructure and economy of our communities. This is important legislation that is going to extend the expanded child tax credit, which will cut child poverty in half. Included in it is my Medicaid Saves Lives Act that will close the coverage gap in our state. It's the plan that's included in the economic package and it would provide health care to more than 640,000 Georgians who would qualify for Medicaid. I've been fighting for Medicaid for years, Medicaid expansion in Georgia, because I believe that health care is a human right. And we know that Medicaid saves lives. But on top of that, as leaders at Grady Memorial Hospital told me when I visited in June, expanding health coverage in Georgia supports and creates good paying jobs. Saves lives, creates jobs. So when we get back to Washington in a couple of weeks, We'll continue to work to wrap up this economic package. And we can't do it quickly enough because we need these investments and we need them in Georgia right now. In closing, and nobody believes a preacher when he says in closing, <laughs> let me say that we must work not only on infrastructure, but we must work on the infrastructure of our democracy. Nationwide, our democracy is under attack. From state level voter suppression efforts, like Georgia's SB 202, that plainly will make it harder for some people to vote and to ensure that their votes are counted even after they vote. I know that this is an important topic to many in this room. And it's no secret that I've been vocal that Congress must act to protect access to the ballot box for every eligible American. And I have hope that we will prevail. So we have to pass voting rights no matter what. And that's why I've been working with a small diverse set of senators from Joe Manchin to Amy Klobuchar to put together legislation that will honor the legacy of Congressman John Lewis by restoring the Voting Rights Act and protecting the sacred right to vote for every eligible American no matter where you live. We're very close to completing that work on our bill, which I hope that we will unveil very soon. On top of that, I fought to help ensure that voting rights will be the first issue that the Senate will take up when we return. Know that we will continue to fight the good fight because I believe that a vote 
is a kind of prayer for the world we desire for ourselves and for our children. And I believe that democracy is the political enactment of a spiritual idea that all of us have within us a spark of the divine and therefore a right to help determine the direction of our country and our destiny within it because that destiny is inextricably tied to the destiny of our neighbors May we march on forward together. God bless you all. has agreed to answer some questions and I would like to kick us off with a question I have of my own. Um, Senator Warnock, you have uh, spent so much time in Atlanta and now having had a period of time away from Atlanta in Washington, I'm curious about some of the new perspectives that you might have coming back to Atlanta. And in particular, I'm curious what opportunities you might see for Atlanta to serve a leadership role in our broader country. Thank you so much for the question. There, there is no question that Atlanta is a special place. Georgia is a special place. And, um, you know, as I was thinking about running for the Senate, I thought about the folks who paved the way for us who've been such an incredible example. And um, near the top of that list for me is John Lewis. Um, he was my parishioner. I was the pastor, but he was the mentor. And what I like about John Lewis, among many things, is the depth of his commitment. And he got really focused on a life's project and he never lost sight of that. I asked myself as I was planning his funeral and planning to preside over the service what he was thinking about that day when he and Hosea Williams were crossing that bridge. I assure you he wasn't thinking about a Presidential Medal of Freedom or that at the end of his life three presidents would be there to honor him from both sides of the aisle. John Lewis across that bridge, a kind of physical infrastructure to strengthen the infrastructure of our democracy. And I think that day he was just trying to stay alive and push us a little bit closer to our ideals. I mentioned him because I think in a real sense, while he's from Troy, Alabama, he's Atlanta, he's Georgia. And I think Georgia has so much to offer as we stood up in this election to that conversation. Atlanta's known as the city that's too busy to hate. I just wanna make sure that we're not the city too busy to love. And justice is what love looks like in public. So let's stand up in the best of our ideals as Georgians, as Atlantans, and I think we have much to contribute to the national conversation, particularly in this moment. Great, thank you. All right, I think we have a couple of microphones that um, if, uh, let's see, got one back here, yep. Senator Warren, when you uh, took the job, you said you were gonna not give up your day job. Are you still coming home every <laughs> Sunday to preach at Ebenezer? <laughs> I still preach at Ebenezer most Sundays, and you're invited in a couple weeks when we go back to hybrid service. Great, thank you. Let's see. I often say that the last thing, I, the reason I come back home, for those of you who are wondering, and I continue to lead my church, I've got a great staff. I preach most weekends. I 
come back home, spend time in the community, spend time in my church, because the last thing I want to do is spend all of my time talking to politicians for fear that I might accidentally become one. Great, thank you. Okay, got one right here in the middle. Uh, Senator, one of the pieces of infrastructure that I have been very concerned about, which I think is addressed in part, is the public education, particularly K-12. to I can't think of anything that's in need of greater strengthening in terms of the long term. Uh, we build bridges for 50-year lifespans and then use them for 100. But the fact of the matter is we've about worn out a lot of the efforts that need to be made, particularly if you talk about trying to prepare the next generation to live in a world in which the digital implications are as much a threat as they are a strength. I share your commitment to public education and strengthening that. Education and access to a good quality education, you're looking at somebody that, I mean, it made all the difference in my life. I know firsthand the importance of good federal investments in our children, actually from age zero and up, pre-K. So I'm excited about this reconciliation bill that we're getting ready to pass because it contains investments zero to four. We don't pay nearly enough attention to that period. And too often we treat the teachers and the folks who serve our preschoolers as if they are babysitters. So we don't pay them much and we don't take it seriously enough. And that's quite unfortunate because between the ages of zero and four, that's when your brain is really literally being built. A lot of smart people in this room, I have sad news for you. You'll never be as smart as you were between zero and four. It all went downhill after that. And the parts, you know, those neurons are firing, the parts that we fail to engage actually atrophy. If you think about that in a real sense, the miracle is that so many poor children do as well as they do given the lack of investment in early education. So there are investments in uh, <clears throat> early education in this uh, in, uh, reconciliation bill is absolutely critical. There are investments on the other side because really K through 12 is no longer enough in this technological world that you described, it's really 14 years of education. And um, I think this has to be the beginning of a commitment because there's no more important infrastructure uh, to invest in than the infrastructure uh, of our people. So I understand that. You're looking at a Head Start baby. You all know what Head Start is? Giving poor children access to early childhood care. I'm in love with Head Start. And then when I was in high school, I was a part of the Upward Bound program exposed kids who would like to be the first college graduate in their family to a college education. It placed me on a college campus as a high school student so I could imagine myself there because I was already there. Spent my summers on the campus of Savannah State University. And then low interest student loans and Pell Grants through college. And now all of these years later after I graduated, our kids have a mortgage before they get a mortgage college education loans have now surpassed credit card debt in our country. So I'm all the way there with you, and I bring that commitment to my work in the Senate. Other questions? Um, oh, over here, Jeff. That, that could be a seminar in, in, unto itself. Um, but 
continuing along the lines of my last point, one of the things we could do, and I would urge the president to do, is, is to deal with student debt, which disproportionately impacts black and brown communities. And so we're, we're more likely, to, we, we assume a lot of debt to get educated, and then, uh, which, is, which is a result of you know, not having generational wealth, which is connected to our country's very complicated past, right? And then the pay gap is real. The racial pay gap and the gender pay gap is real. So part of how you would narrow this wealth gap is to do something robust and bold to address student debt. That's one thing that we could do. Great. I think there was another question over here. Yep. Senator Warner, thank you so much for uh, making your staff as accessible as they were to Fulton County government um, to discuss emergency rental assistance. I just got off uh, the phone with one of your staff la last Friday and they were very helpful as a condu conduit between our government and Treasury, so thank you for that. Um, I do have a question that's related to that, which is the Supreme Court's decision last uh, week seems to put uh, the decision about eviction moratoriums back on Congress. So my question is whether or not you and your <coughs> colleagues are working on anything uh, to address that. And even more important, is there anything in the infrastructure bill that will help us address um, affordable housing on a more uh, macro scale? Housing is infrastructure. There is some support for affordable housing in the reconciliation bill. And yes, I think Congress needs to act on this immediately. Um, just oh. one quick question. I think historically you and um, Senator Ossoff uh, were elected on the same day, which I think historically was sort of the first time that's happened. Could you share a little bit about how the two of you all have worked together um, and what that's been like? John Ossoff, my brother from another mother, as I call him. <laughs> no, we, we worked closely together. We, we got to know each other during the campaign. I had heard of him because of his earlier campaign, and he'd heard of me but we got to know each other while we were campaigning. And um, if we look like we are having fun and enjoy our relationship, it's true, it's not politics. He's a friend. And um, we work together in the places where it makes sense, but uh, he was elected, I was elected, and, and um, uh, we, we work together in the places where it makes sense. And we, we, you know, we don't always agree on those things, but we're, we're both working hard together to, together to do all we can for the state of Georgia. All right, one last question. Is that it for now? I am, I am a little bitter, to be honest with you, though. <laughs> I, I don't understand how he gets to be the senior senator <laughs> in Georgia. And, I mean, how does that happen? And, <laughs> and I'm, I'm, the junior, I'm the junior senator. I'm, I'm significantly older than he is. <laughs> Um, but he's a senior senator. You know why he's the senior senator? So when, when you come in, we came in together, so then there are things that they evaluate, and all of the things that count, like being a, a governor of a state prior to being a senator, not, we're even on all of those things. So he's the senior senator um, because his last name begins with an O. <laughs> and, my, and mine begins with a W. Go figure. All right, Senator Warnock, thank you so much. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.